In this episode, we look at the costumes of the HBO series Gentleman Jack, a visual cornucopia of early 19th century costumes. Coming up. Welcome back to Costume Co. I do almost weekly videos analyzing television shows and movies from a costume perspective. If you want to keep up to date on my latest videos, consider subscribing so you don't miss out. Warning, there are spoilers for all eight episodes of Gentleman Jack, Season 1. This video is the first part of a two-part series on the costumes of Gentleman Jack, a 2019 historical drama television series created by writer and director Sally Wainwright. Thank you to costume designer Romy McCloskey, who recommended that I watch this series and that I binged watched it in just a few days. Romy has also started a Gentleman Jack Costumes Facebook group, so I'll leave a link for that in the description below if you want to check it out. Gentleman Jack is produced by Lookout Point Limited for the BBC and co-produced with HBO where it airs in North America. Said in 1832, the story is based upon the diaries of real-life landowner and industrialist Anne Lister, portrayed in the show by English actor Saran Jones. The costumes were brought to the small screen by costume and set designer Tom Pye. He tells me in a recent interview that he studied theatre design at Wimbledon School of Art in southwest London before embarking on a 30-year career in theatre, opera, ballet, film and television. Tom worked with creator Sally Wainwright on the 2016 British television film To Walk Invisible about the Bronte family. When I asked Tom if his experience on To Walk Invisible, which is set in 1845, had prepared him for taking on the costumes of Gentleman Jack, he said, with even just a 10-year difference between them, they required very different looks. The nature and style of both projects is also quite different, he said. Gentleman Jack is a lot more playful with its faster pace and a grander scale, while To Walk Invisible was a far darker, more serious chamber piece that really focused on the domestic life of one family. What was helpful, Tom said, is that it had been years since I've been on a film set, so To Walk Invisible was a great refresher for the complicated daily workings of a filming schedule. In many ways, it was a helpful primer to working on Gentleman Jack. Tom researched the costumes of Gentleman Jack through a variety of means. He studied painted portraits of the era, and he spent a lot of time gaining access to original clothing kept in museum archives around the country, such as the Bath Museum, Chertsey, Bankfield, Winchester Museums, and the John Bright Collection in London. Here's an example of this type of silhouette of a woman's costume from the early 1830s. This dress is dated circa 1830 from the John Bright Collection. This American cotton dress with gigot or gigot sleeves from the Met dates between 1832 to 1835. Gigot is a French word for leg. This style of sleeve is also called leg of mutton or leg of mutton because of its resemblance to a mutton leg. And according to the Met, sleeves like this were popular from the 1830s through 1836, when they began to diminish to the tightly fitted sleeves of the following period. This cotton and linen dress, it's dated between 1832 to 35, and it's also from the Met. Here is a detail of the dress fabric. The Met states that the fashions during this time allowed the textiles to stand out because of the vast surface area of the skirt and a relatively minimal amount of excess trim. Here's some of Tom's research that include mood boards or influence boards as he calls them. These are both dated from February 2017 and are titled Sexuality, Gender and Dress and can be found along with many of his designs on his Instagram account. Tom tells me that the idea for the top hat came from the ladies of Thlangathlan and from George Sand. Sand was one of the most notable 19th century women who chose to wear male attire in public. In the late 18th century, the ladies of Langathlan escaped unwanted marriages in Ireland before fleeing to Wales with a servant. Both women were said to dress in black riding habits and men's hats, and Lister was said to have visited the couple. 
Here is another influence board that Thomas titled Polizes, Redding Goats, and Military References. The Polize or Redding Goat are long women's outer coats like the ones pictured on the left. Pictured here is Ann Lister's last diary entry from August 11th, 1840, just six weeks before her death. Tom said, I spent a lot of time with Ann Lister's diaries too. In them, there are plenty of mentions of her clothing, including her corsets or stays, skirts, her Spencer jacket, her great coat, gaiters, waistcoats, petticoats, and pelisse. This all gave me a good framework to begin with. One of my favorite aspects of the show are the estates and the beautifully designed interiors that complement the costume so well. Tom tells me that he had a great time collaborating with production designer Ann Pritchard, who designed the scenery and oversaw all of the props and furnishings. Tom said, we always shared ideas about forthcoming scenes, and as the series progressed, I knew which wallpapers and rooms the characters would be playing within. And in knowing so, I very deliberately coordinated the costumes with the interiors. He adds, but sometimes this worked totally organically. Anna and I would often have very similar responses. For example, independently, we both designed color palettes for scenes in Shibden Hall and Crow Nest and Walker's house, and our palettes were almost identical. The Georgian elegance of Ann Walker's house called for light, elegant tones compared to the dark, rich earth tones of Shibden Hall and its Elizabethan heritage. It was a real pleasure to work with Anna and her team. Tom has a great many resources at his disposal, and when it comes to sourcing out fabrics, he casts his net very wide and states that finding the right fabrics is half the job. Modern looking fabrics can kill the finished look of a costume, he adds, and there can be nothing you can do to rectify this. Tom said, trims, buttons, ribbons, and the like are relatively easy. I bought a lot from car boot sales and antique markets. In fact, I never stopped doing that. Most weekends, I'm out at car boot sales. A car boot sale, by the way, is the equivalent of a trunk sale that you might see in America. Tom finds that online e-sellers Etsy and eBay can be useful, saying, We always had a big stock of vintage trims on the truck. The cotton prints came from the USA. There are several great companies reproducing original 18th and 19th century prints over there. Tom tells me that for silk, I'm lucky enough to live close to the historic silk weaving town Sudbury in Suffolk. Over the years, I've forged great relationships with a couple of the mills there that still produce amazing fabrics, many of them based on their original patterns. Tom adds that both mills will also weave any colorway in any design from their pattern books, which are over 200 years old. I've used them many times for scenic wall covering and upholstery, as well as for costume. Tom said, I also used all of the more obvious places in London, like Shepherd's Bush Market, the stores on Barrack Street, and Hopkins Fabrics. I also went to Fucotex in Germany, who were wonderful. And finally, Tom also tells me that once filming up in Yorkshire, we also used a lot of local mills too. Many of the UK's finest are still producing in Yorkshire, so it was great to have them all on our doorstep. Denholm, Velvets, Abraham Moon and Sons, West Yorkshire Fabrics, James Hare, and of course, Whaley's. They are all within a few miles of our set and were really helpful. With an assortment of custom-made and rented costumes gathered from a variety of sources, Tom tells me that it's impossible to know how many costumes were used in season one, saying it was possibly in the thousands. Tom said that we had one scene in the first episode with 200 background artists for just one day. Most days in the street scenes, we had around 100, and their costumes varied enormously depending on whether they were agricultural workers, factory workers, or wealthy London society. So we didn't need an awful lot of costumes. At one point, we had four trucks full of stock. As the season developed, we literally ran out of costumes we could find to hire for background artists. With this many costumes to rent, build, alter, and fit on actors and background players, you might think that Tom had an enormous team at his disposal, but he says, actually, comparatively speaking, the costume department was very small. We didn't have tailors or permanent dressmakers on set. Everything I designed was built either at Cosprop in London or by freelancers. We also brought a number of other assistants as and when we needed them for big crowd days. 
Tom said that his immediate team was comprised of Nadine Davern, the brilliant costume supervisor I worked on to walk invisible, two standbys Ruth Fallon and Tyler Anderson, who never left the set and looked after everyone during filming, keeping meticulous and exhaustive continuity records, Eileen Fowler, a great crowd supervisor. The crowd standby was Susie Leland and JC Conroy joined as a trainee dressing extras, undertaking alterations and basically everything else. Zeb Laliji and Martin Clark both helped a lot in prep, and Jan Simpson came in for episode eight to help us out on the big ball scenes. While the tailoring and costumes are fantastic, one of the standout features of the production are the 19th century hats. Tom said, I worked with a really fabulous milliner named Sean Barrett. You might recognize some of Sean's work in Downton Abbey, The Crown, and more recently, Rocket Man. Tom tells me that I've known Sean for nearly 30 years. We met while working together in the costume department of the Kevin Costner film Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Ever since then, I've regularly asked Sean to make hats and bonnets for me on theater productions. He also made the hats for To Walk Invisible. And then Tom tells me that on bigger scenes, such as the wedding, Sean put a small team together to help him redress all the bonnets, but the main principal hats he made himself. Some were also hired and redressed by various costume houses, such as Cosprop. Here's Tom's reference and influence board from his Instagram for the underpinnings that you don't get to see on screen. Tom told Frogflix, it's sort of bonkers with the massive Gigo sleeves and the pads they wore under the sleeves to hold them up. Tom told me that helpfully, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London had a pair of original sleeve pads from this period on display at the time I was designing. It was really helpful to see how they secured to the corset straps. They're basically a feather-filled linen bag that straps around the upper arm to hold the sleeves out. The sleeves look rather sad without the pads. They are rather ridiculous. Helpful when you bump into doorways. Here's another set of sleeve supports that I found at the Met. They state that sleeve supports were frequently downfilled pillows, but chintz with rib of wire or cane was also used to make somewhat airier lantern-like forms. And this set are made from cotton and whale baleen. There are also so many great supporting characters. When I asked Tom what his approach to designing their costumes, he told me, I began with Anne and Anne. They were my main focus at the first. I wanted to be sure who my main characters were and then work outwards. He continues by saying, I wanted everyone else to be in relation to them. We had a lot of other characters, well over a hundred named characters from all sorts of different social classes. The complicated part was that most of them were based on real people, so I needed to do as much research as I could to try to keep an accuracy across the board. Tom adds that, for example, we went to huge lengths in episode two to get Sir Donald Cameron correct. We ended up having his tartan woven up in Scotland for the costume seen in his wedding so that it correctly reflected the real Donald Cameron and his status as head of his Scottish clan. We even sourced eagle feathers for his cap. Now juxtaposed to Anne Lister's largely black wardrobe and the pastel palette of Anne Walker, the Rawson brothers are dressed up in layers of rich jewel tones. Of costuming the antagonist with these colors, Tom said, that was a choice I made while working with the great actors Vincent Franklin and Sean Dooley who played the Rawson brothers. I had an idea that as self-made men in the town, they might be quite ostentatious and want to flaunt their status and wealth, he said. The actors both loved this idea and ran with it. We had fun dressing them as peacocks, especially Vincent. He's worse than his slightly quieter brother. And in the next video, we'll get more into the specific costumes as I continue my interview with Tom Pye. I'll also feature many of Tom's costume sketches that he generously shared with me. You can also read my full interview with Tom Pye on my Facebook page. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. In the meantime, you can check out my video on the costumes of Crimson Peak. I'll see you in the next video.